20-year-old Georgette Bauerdorf was living the life she always wanted. Independent, smart, and very giving, she spent much of her free time working as a hostess at the old Hollywood Canteen, a club for soldiers shipping off to World War II. In October of 1944, Georgette made plans to travel to Texas and visit a soldier she'd been smitten with. In the days leading up to her trip, she followed her normal routine, days out with her father's secretary, nights at the canteen. However, on October 11th, Georgette would leave the canteen for the final time. The next morning, two employees of her West Hollywood apartment complex found Georgette murdered and left floating in the bathtub. The light bulb outside of her door had been loosened, her car had been taken, and aside from the horrible scene of the murder, there were no signs of forced entry or a struggle. For years, investigators tried to determine who could have been responsible, but now, some 75 years later, Georgette's killer's identity remains unknown and her crime unsolved. Many horrible crimes happened in Hollywood during the golden age of cinema, but Georgette's case remains one of the most haunting and mysterious. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 94, The Murder of Georgette Bauerdorf. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the horrible murder of Georgette Bauerdorf. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at traceevpod on Instagram at Trace Evidence Podcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash traceevidence where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. Today we examine the 1944 murder of Georgette Bauerdorf, a case which hit its 75th year of being cold just last week. This is episode 94, The Murder of Georgette Bauerdorf. Georgette Elise Bauerdorf was born on May 6, 1924, and was the second daughter of oil executive George and his wife Constance. While the couple's first daughter, Constance, had been named after their mother, it only made sense for their second child to be named after the father. Born in New York City, Georgette came into a wealthy and opulent life, with her father working in the oil and mining industry and doing quite well for himself and his family. Georgette was, by all definitions, a kind and sweet young girl who had a soft spot in her heart for those who hadn't been born into the wealth and privilege that she had, a compassion and a giving nature which would remain true until the end of her life. As a child, Georgette would be sent to attend St. Agatha's School for Girls, a religious school designed to teach young women both education and religious belief. I found multiple descriptions of the curriculum at the time, though one article written by TheLineUp.com described Georgette as being trained in, quote, goodness and propriety. Some have gone on to express that Georgette was trained to be both an astute and well-mannered child, but also likely was given some education in how to behave based upon her social status. Sadly, when Georgette was just nine years old, her mother, Constance, passed away at the age of 40. The loss of her mother had a powerful effect on the family, and it wasn't long after Constance had passed that George Bauerdorf made the decision to uproot the family, moving from the busy streets of New York to the sun and warmth of Southern California, settling in Los Angeles. It's been said that this series of events had a dramatic impact on young Georgette. First, the loss of her mother, followed by moving away from everything she'd ever known, Many have gone on to speculate that the move was a calculated decision and perhaps one of necessity, 
with the memories of Constance too strong and painful for George to continue living in the family home. In California, Georgette would continue to be educated in high-profile schools with long lists of prominent former students. She would attend the Marlboro School, which the same year of her birth, 1924, had seen a shift in leadership. Mary Caswell had begun the school, though Ada Blake would take over in 24, and it was through her efforts that the curriculum was expanded, shifting away from a focus on manners and behavior and more towards study and knowledge. The Marlboro School would go on to acquire a reputation for having a challenging curriculum, which truly put its young students to the test, but also helped them establish a foothold in the world of education. Georgette would also attend the Westlake School for Girls, another well-known and prominent preparatory school. Georgette lived a privileged life, as one would expect for being the daughter of a rich oil billionaire. There were trips abroad in Europe and at home, with the Bauerdorfs touring Europe not long before the outbreak of World War II. Georgette was well-traveled and loved the adventure of going out to discover more of the world. As she grew older, Georgette began to set her sights on her own desires for the future, and in 1941, she would graduate from Westlake with bright eyes and big dreams just a half a year before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor would send the United States overseas to join the battlefields of the Second World War. However, back at home, the world was also changing. By the early 1940s, the golden age of Hollywood was in full swing. The year Georgette graduated from 12th grade would see the release of several films which would live on to be classics, including the indelible Citizen Kane. Perhaps it was the romance of the cinema or her proximity to Hollywood that first grabbed Georgette's attention, but by this time in her life, she yearned to be on the silver screen. She would move from the family home in Los Angeles to West Hollywood, moving into an apartment at the El Palacio Apartments, joining her sister Constance. At the El Palacio, it was known as being the home to multiple Hollywood celebrities known for work both in front of and behind the cameras. El Palacio was located at 8493 Fountain Avenue, just south of the famous strip of Sunset Boulevard. Here, Georgette would live with her sister and her sister's husband, John Francis Dillon, who would tragically lose his life in World War II. The beautifully stuccoed buildings were an eye-catching sight, though within these walls, several dark incidents would occur. Dorothy Dandridge, the famous actress and singer who made headlines becoming the first black female to receive an Academy Award nomination, would die within the walls of El Palacio in September of 1965. Dorothy's death was, and remains, somewhat debated as to whether it was due to an embolism, an accidental overdose, or perhaps something more sinister. But 19 years earlier, in the fall of 1944, Georgette Bauerdorf would also be found dead within the walls of El Palacio. However, her death would quickly be labeled a homicide and the investigation would send shockwaves throughout Southern California. The early 1940s were a challenging time for the United States. Still feeling the results of the Great Depression and now hurled into the Second World War, there were difficult times ahead. Hollywood would be charged with helping with morale, and aside from a slew of dramatic war films, Mary Ingram would found the United Service Organizations, or USO, which would see movie stars, comedians, and all manner of celebrities traveling both at home and abroad to entertain the troops and bring some levity into a dark time. Georgette would find herself, at the age of 20, working for the Los Angeles Times in the Women's Services Bureau while also volunteering as a hostess at the famous Hollywood Canteen. Located on Coanga Boulevard, the Hollywood Canteen was a club started by such notable names as Betty Davis and John Garfield, which offered food, entertainment, and dancing to U.S. soldiers, typically those who were preparing to travel overseas and join the war effort. Georgette's volunteer position would see her working any number of tasks throughout a given evening, though perhaps her favorite of these activities included dancing and socializing with the men in uniform. While the canteen itself had strict rules that hostesses could not leave with any of the soldiers, many hostesses found that if they left separately and met up later, then technically that wasn't a violation of the rule. An article in the Knoxville Journal described her connection with soldiers by saying, quote, She attracted many a homesick G.I. Joe and being good-hearted, generous and fun-loving, she accepted many of their requests. 
She took them riding in her car. She entertained them in nightclubs and picked up the checks. End quote. Reportedly, Georgette's interests expanded beyond the canteen, where she often gave rides to soldiers she found hitchhiking around town and wouldn't think twice about buying them lunch or dinner. Georgette wrote about her interactions with soldiers in her diary, a red leather-bound book which would be studied extensively after her death. In one entry, she commented on her friends who warned her to be careful around soldiers, to which Georgette wrote the response, quote, Oh, I am. But I think if these boys are willing to fight for us, we ought to do anything we can for them. End quote. Georgette has been described as extremely giving and perhaps a little naive. There were those close to her who were concerned that she might come across a soldier who'd be looking to take advantage, or perhaps worse. Then there were the social implications. Considering the mindset of the 1940s, there were those who began to question Georgette's intentions and rumors began circulating, but those who knew Georgette knew that her interest was in helping out and being charitable, with her close friend June Ziegler telling a reporter, quote, yes, she had lots of dates, but I know for a fact she made it a practice never to admit a man to her apartment unless there were others present, end quote. Of course, I've also read accounts that Georgette often gave copies of her apartment keys to soldiers, offering them a place to stay should they need it. In articles of the time, however, Georgette's frequent need for copies of her keys was chalked up to her being forgetful and misplacing them constantly. God forbid in 1944 that you allow an adult male into your apartment when you're a 20-year-old female, but apparently those were the ways of the days. Georgette traveled throughout the summer of 1944, going around the United States with her family. She traveled to Louisiana via train, stopping for a time while her father conducted some business in the area. She then continued the journey, arriving in New York, having not returned to her home state in many years. According to GeorgetteBauerdorf.com, it was in New York that she would write letters to June, discussing her activities, which included seeing plays on Broadway and of course spending time around men in uniform, noting that, quote, New York's full of coast guards and sailors, end quote. Beyond that, Georgette commented about how all the time she spent in California had given her an appreciation and perhaps a nostalgia for the cold, snowy weather of a New York winter. Georgette returned to Southern California, and while her family had another trip planned for New York in August, she wouldn't be going along with them. In fact, she would never take another trip. On August 28th, the Bauerdorf family began their trip back to New York, with Georgette remaining behind in West Hollywood. Georgette's father left his secretary, Rose Gilbert, behind to keep an eye on Georgette and help her with anything she might need. According to Gilbert, she and Georgette spent a lot of time together, but ultimately, Georgette was a fiercely independent woman who often did as she pleased and, at 20 years old, didn't find it necessary to be chaperoned or to have to ask permission. According to Gilbert, in early October, Georgette informed her of travel plans. A friend of hers, Jerry W. Brown, whom she had met through the canteen, would be graduating, and on October 13th, Georgette had the full intentions of attending his graduation, which would take place at Fort Bliss in Texas. While newspapers of the time described Brown as a friend, GeorgetteBauerdorf.com and more contemporary articles describe him as her boyfriend. Of course, this is a trip that Georgette will never be able to make. In fact, she'll be murdered just days before that trip was to take place. Wednesday, October 11th, 1944, didn't begin as an unusual day for Georgette. After conducting her morning routine and getting ready for the day, she got together with Rose Gilbert. The two women had made plans to do some shopping together and then to sit down to lunch before Georgette had to get to the beauty parlor for a hair appointment. At some point, while the two were together, Georgette stopped to cash a check for $175, which she then used to buy a plane ticket to El Paso for her trip to see Jerry Brown. Reportedly, Brown and Georgette had exchanged a lot of letters and frequently spoke on the phone in the weeks leading up to their reunion. According to the Los Angeles Times, Gilbert would later tell investigators that, in her opinion, Georgette was in good spirits and there didn't appear to be any concerns on her part perhaps beyond a little nervousness about her flight to Texas. After getting her hair done, Georgette returned to her home where she ran into a janitor who worked for El Palacio. Fred Atwood reported to investigators that he had spoken with Georgette 
who had asked him to take a box down to the basement. Atwood noted that Georgette appeared to be doing well and that she was her usual polite self, thanking him for taking the box down for her. This would be the last time Atwood would see Georgette alive, and he would be one half of the pair who would make the discovery of her body the following morning. A notation later found in Georgette's diary noted that at 6.30 p.m., she had plans to meet June at the canteen. Investigators later wondered if this was written down previously as a reminder or if Georgette had written it after returning home from her evening. Either way, June Ziegler confirmed that she did meet and spend some time with Georgette that night. While Gilbert and Atwood had both described Georgette as being in good spirits and seemingly doing well, two people would later say that when they ran into her that evening, she seemed nervous and preoccupied. June later told the Knoxville Journal, quote, I was late for the appointment. Georgette said she was nervous, but she didn't say why. She asked me to spend the night with her, but I couldn't do it. End quote. While the reason for Georgette's nervousness has never been uncovered, there have been various reports of a soldier who was harassing her that night at the canteen. Reportedly, this particular soldier had an interest in Georgette and wouldn't leave her alone. While the young woman tried to be polite and kind, as was her usual demeanor, this man sought to take advantage of that, pulling Georgette onto the dance floor against her will and even forcibly cutting in on her dances with other soldiers. According to June, Georgette did not like this particular soldier and only went along with his behavior so as not to cause any trouble. Both June and Georgette left the canteen at approximately 11.30 p.m. According to June, Georgette had said she had plans to drive straight home to her apartment and had no intentions of doing anything else after the canteen that night. The two women strode past the security guard and said goodnight before heading off in different directions. A sign-out sheet would later confirm the time the two women had left the club, which would mean that if Georgette did drive straight home, she'd arrive around midnight. As far as investigators have ever been able to surmise, June Ziegler was the last person to see Georgette alive, outside of her killer. There were, however, at least two reports of sounds coming from Georgette's apartment the night she was killed. Atwood, who lived in an apartment directly below Georgette's, told authorities that he had heard the sounds of a woman's high heels clicking along the kitchen floor, followed by a loud crashing sound. Atwood told the LA Times, quote, There was a crash as if somebody dropped a tray or something, then everything was quiet, end quote. Atwood noted that these sounds had woken him up, and it was approximately midnight. A neighbor who chose to remain anonymous informed police that between 2 and 3 a.m., he heard a female screaming from inside Georgette's apartment. He later stated that he'd heard the woman yell, Stop it, you're killing me. Interestingly, another neighbor who lived directly across from Georgette reported that she hadn't heard any sounds out of the ordinary that night. At approximately 11.10 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, October 12th, Fred Atwood and his wife, Lulu, who also worked with him, finished cleaning an apartment next to Georgette's. Walking across the hall, the two approached the door to the apartment and found it partially open. Gently nudging the door all the way open, Lulu called into the apartment asking if anyone was home, but received no response. As Lulu and Fred entered the apartment, they found everything in perfect order, though there was a sound which grabbed their attention. The apartment layout had the kitchen and living room on the ground floor while the bedrooms and bathrooms were on the second level. Echoing through the apartment, they could hear what sounded like water dripping into an upstairs bathtub. Concerned about a possible leak, the couple headed upstairs to check the situation. As Lulu approached the bathroom, she looked inside and immediately screamed. Fred rushed to her side and found out what was wrong when he too was struck by the sight before him. Georgette Bauerdorf was discovered in the bathtub. Her body was face down, a rag clenched between her teeth. The tub was approximately three quarters full and appeared a pale shade of red due to the blood. Georgette's body was partially clad, wearing only her pink pajama top and no bottoms. Her hair was fanned out against the surface of the water as she float lifelessly. At the time, Fred and Lulu didn't think she was dead, assuming that she may have fainted, and so they drained the tub and pulled her from the water. Once they had their hands on Georgette, they discovered that she was cooling to the touch and there was no doubt that the 20-year-old was gone. Fred remained with Georgette while Lulu rushed down the stairs to notify the police. 
Over the course of the next hour, a seemingly endless line of deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office arrived. It was clear to investigators that they were dealing with a homicide, though the motive would be more difficult to ascertain. A search of the apartment found little out of place, and the fingerprints picked up through forensic analysis were quite extensive. The autopsy determined that sometime between 10.30 and 4 a.m., Georgette had eaten string beans and cantaloupe, though the discovery of a cantaloupe rind in the apartment's trash and a dirty dish in the sink led authorities to believe that she had eaten the meal after getting home. The medical examiner, Frank Webb, would ultimately rule that Georgette's death was as the result of asphyxiation, the rag found in her mouth having been shoved several inches down her throat. The examination also determined that Georgette had engaged in sexual intercourse sometime after 10.30 p.m., though whether or not this was voluntary or the result of sexual assault was not determined at that time. The moments leading up to Georgette's death have been highly debated. While Webb initially stated that the bruising on her body, including her right shoulder and eye and her nose, may have been the result of her body impacting the tub as it was believed her killer simply allowed her to fall into the tub after asphyxiating her. An examination of Georgette's bedroom showed no signs of a struggle, her blanket being pulled down, but her sheets did not appear to be wrinkled or freshly used. However, her pajama bottoms were found at the floor at the foot of her bed, ripped, leading investigators to believe her attacker may have torn them from her body. Her purse lay exposed on the dresser, next to several valuable pieces of jewelry, though all that appeared to be missing was $75 in cash. Webb also believed that scratches found near Georgette's mouth may have come as a result of her killer trying to remove the rag from her throat. The rag would prove to be an important clue, with the Knoxville Journal reporting that it was part of an elastic bandage manufactured overseas and having not been imported to the United States since 1939. Whether or not this was something Georgette owned or perhaps belonged to a soldier who had brought it home from overseas was uncertain. Beyond the bedroom, police found a wet spot on the carpet, though they couldn't determine if this was a spot of blood the killer tried to clean or if Georgette had simply spilled something. Forensics of the 1940s weren't that great. One strange detail were the cigarette butts. Georgette was not known to be a smoker, and whoever had been smoking in the apartment had, rather than using an ashtray, snubbed the cigarettes out by rubbing them directly against the apartment's floor. Detectives noted that the apartment door had a secure lock, suggesting that no one could gain entry without a key or perhaps waiting for Georgette to appear and then forcing her to unlock the door. There was also the possibility that Georgette may have known her killer and allowed him inside, unaware of his dark intentions. One interesting detail was the light bulb outside of Georgette's apartment. Investigators found that the bulb had been rotated two full twists counterclockwise, making the light switch useless. Whoever had been to Georgette's apartment, it is believed, Loosen the bulb so that when the young woman gazed through her peephole, she'd have difficulty making out exactly who was knocking at her door. This would make it difficult for anyone in the building itself to get a clear look at the perpetrator as well. A single fingerprint was recovered from the bulb. Examination of the apartment told a confusing story. Investigators began operating off the possibility that Georgette's killer either knew her and was allowed in, or maybe had gained entry to the apartment while Georgette was out and waited for her to return. While nothing was ransacked and there was no indication of a major struggle, it was believed that some of the bruising on Georgette's body became as a result of fighting back against her killer. Outside of the apartment, police discovered that Georgette's car, which she had borrowed from her sister, was missing. There was a lot of debate about Georgette's murder, and with times being what they were, a lot of what may have occurred was lost between the lines, either intentionally or not. As an example of the difference between how this case was handled then and how it would be handled now, I have to read this quote to you from Deputy Sheriff Hutchins. Quote, Neither robbery nor rape appears to have been the motive. During the intimacy, she may have cried, and the slayer, intending only to stop her cries, but not to choke her, may have shoved the cloth down her throat. He may have taken the $75 to make it look like a robbery, but he did not take the jewels, and police feel that a bona fide robber doesn't stop for rape. Furthermore, this wasn't rape. The police think the killer left in her car. Unless he was watching her as she stepped from her car, how did he happen to take her coupe? End quote. 
Pardon me for a moment, but are you shitting me with this? I'll get into it more in the theories, but I have no idea how they could determine the day she was found that this wasn't rape. Also, that whole thing about the rag is just pure speculation. He has no idea why the rag was placed in her throat. As for the car, it seems apparent that this person likely knew her, so it really isn't all that shocking that her car was taken. Beyond that, I'm pretty sure robbery and rape are not exclusive crimes in all instances. This opinion, thankfully, would later change, with rape being believed to have occurred after examination showed trauma and tears to Georgette's vaginal frenulum. Investigators had their hands full when it came to potential suspects. Aside from reports given by friends, such as June's account of the pushy soldier at the canteen the night Georgette died, there were also a lot of names written by Georgette's own hand in her diary. Tracking them down wouldn't be easy, but the LA Sheriff's Office worked with the military to try and get locations for at least the soldiers that were named. The pushy soldier came forward, being a 24-year-old Air Force mechanic named Cosmo Volpe. He would claim that he had meant no harm and he didn't realize he was being as pushy as others had depicted him. He was ruled out as a suspect when military records from his base showed that he had signed back into his base prior to Georgette's murder. After reading about Georgette's murder in the papers, another soldier reached out to authorities. This man, Sergeant Gordon Adland, reported that he was hitchhiking around 11 to 11.30 p.m., when a young woman fitting Georgette's description had picked him up and dropped him off on Sunset Boulevard. According to Adland, the young woman had told him she was planning to visit Texas to see a friend, and in his statement, he told authorities that Georgette seemed nervous, though he was not privy as to why. This seems to corroborate June's story about Georgette seeming uncomfortable and nervous that night at the canteen. Adlin told authorities that Georgette had explained she was waiting to receive a message from the man in Texas, and that if that message was there, she'd be flying out to meet him the next day. Initially, Adlin told authorities that Georgette turned right after dropping him off, which would take her in the opposite direction of her apartment, though he later cleared this up. In a statement on GeorgetteBauerdorf.com, Adlin says, quote, I said she dropped me off on sunset and then turned right. That is because at that place, the only turn was right. The probable truth is that further along is a left turn off sunset, which she probably took to get to her apartment, end quote. Adlin also specified that maybe Georgette wasn't nervous as he'd seen her constantly looking in her rearview mirror, but some people do that a lot and it didn't necessarily mean she was nervous. Adlin would tell reporters that his fingerprints should have been in the vehicle, but police never contacted him about them. Constance's vehicle, the coupe driven by Georgette, was found the day after the murder investigation began. Ten miles away, the coupe had been abandoned on East 25th Street, a location at least one newspaper described as a lower-income area. When the vehicle was found, the gas tank was empty, and so investigators assumed that the car had been abandoned in this location due to running out of fuel, rather than it being a pre-planned dump site. The keys were left dangling from the ignition, and fingerprints were pulled, though they were reportedly badly smeared. The FBI and War Department were sent copies of the prints from the car, as well as the light bulb, though they didn't match any known criminal on record, nor did they match any soldiers. By the time this information was revealed, police began to realize they'd spent a lot of time searching for a soldier when now it seemed possible their killer could have been a civilian. Some have drawn connections between Georgette's murder and that of the famous Black Dahlia, both having been Hollywood hopefuls and reportedly the two women had met once at the Hollywood canteen. The problem with that, though, is that Georgette was murdered two years before Elizabeth Short came to Los Angeles. The canteen itself wasn't even in operation by the time the Black Dahlia arrived. Remember earlier when I mentioned that the vehicle was found in a lower income area? Well, apparently that, along with some other descriptors, was a 1940s newspaper's way of describing areas inhabited predominantly by African Americans. Due to the discovery of the car, police began looking at two potential suspects, both black males who had previously worked at the El Palacio Apartments, suggesting that they had been in possession of keys which would have granted them access to all apartments, including Georgette's. These two men, however, had alibis for the time of the murder, and no evidence could be found to connect them to the crime or Georgette herself. For the most part, the case began growing cold around this time. Following an official inquest on October 20th, 
Georgette's remains were released to the family who had her return to New York. She was officially laid to rest in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Strangely, when the family was notified of Georgette's death, they argued against it being anything other than natural causes and no one returned from New York to LA to receive her body, instead requesting that she be sent to the East Coast. Two months after Georgette's murder, a man named John Lehman Sumter, 22 years old, confessed to the murder. The former sailor had received a dishonorable discharge from the Navy and at one point was court-martialed by the Army. He claimed that he had taken the 20-year-old's life. Police, however, were suspicious of Sumter's confession as many of the details about the crime didn't match up with known facts. Ultimately, Sumter was ruled out, and years later the man claimed to have lied about the entire situation, saying that he was in a bad place in his life, he felt lost after being kicked from the military, and he wanted very much to be found guilty so that he could be executed. A year after the murder, another confession would come in, this one having been typed and left unsigned. A note found by a young schoolgirl was written by someone claiming to have committed the crime. The note in full reads, quote, To the Los Angeles police, Almost a year ago, Georgette Bauerdorf, age 20, Hollywood canteen hostess, was murdered in her apartment in West Hollywood. Between now and October 11th, a year after her death, the one who murdered her will appear at the Hollywood canteen. The murderer will be in uniform. He has, since he committed the murder, been in action in Okinawa. The murder of Georgette Bauerdorf was divine retribution. Let the police arrest the murderer, if they can. End quote. Police quickly ruled this note out, though, believing it to be a teenager's prank as there was iodine smeared on the note to give the impression of blood. The closest investigators ever came to someone who they believed may have been a potential suspect was 20-year-old Robert George Pollock White. White was arrested for murdering a 65-year-old woman in San Diego by forcing a rag down her throat. During questioning by authorities, White alleged to have been in Los Angeles during the time that Georgette was murdered, though further investigation failed to find any links between White and Georgette. Beyond that, White denied any involvement and he didn't match the fingerprints the LA County Sheriff's Office had on file. And so, as mysteriously as Georgette's killer had come from the shadows, he seemingly returned to them, and now, 75 years after her murder, Georgette Bauerdorf's killer remains unknown. After all these years, there really are two different sections of theories related to this case into which most thoughts fall. The first argues that Georgette's giving nature and kindness may have led to her downfall. Many have stated their belief that Georgette's killer may have been a soldier, or perhaps someone posing as a soldier, who she met along the way, possibly offering a ride or a place to stay, and things took a dark turn. The second theory puts forth the possibility that Georgette may have been murdered by someone she knew and trusted, perhaps a friend or former boyfriend. Her diary had a lot of names in it, a lot of potential suspects, and it's not outside of the realm of possibility that she could have been killed by a jealous ex, friend, or even associate. 75 years ago, Georgette Bauerdorf drove home on an October night and the next morning she was found murdered. A loving, kind, and caring young woman, Georgette went out of her way to support the troops, help her friends, and to do whatever she could to contribute. She had dreams of Hollywood, of being an actress and creating a beautiful life, and all of that was taken away by an unknown killer who robbed the world of a compassionate soul. One has to read between the lines to get much information written about this case, especially when examining news articles of the time, but one thing is clear. Not a single person seemed to have any issues with Georgette, and every account is rather glowing. Yet we know at least one person saw the light that was Georgette and wanted only to extinguish that brilliance. The murder of Georgette Bauerdorf, while extremely high profile at the time, is a case I don't see or read a whole lot about. A smart, determined, and beautiful young woman, Georgette lived a very independent life and did things on her own terms. Perhaps an outlier at the time, Georgette seemed less concerned about the public's perception of her than she was about doing what she wanted to do. When she was found murdered, a lot of articles about her life require a lot of reading between the lines. 
Speculation ran wild, and perhaps it was the horrors that would come years later surrounding the Black Dahlia that would force Georgette's story further down into the annals of history. However, there is no doubt that this was a terrible crime for which no answers have ever been found. You'd imagine there'd be a lot of theories after 75 years, and to a degree there are, but when you put most of those theories through the most logical tests, they fall short. There are those who try to link Georgette to Elizabeth Short, but even a basic examination of the facts eradicates most of those stories. At the time, there were a lot of whispers about Georgette's interactions with men, her dating life having led to her downfall, but that seems to be little more than the mindset of the time, a young woman who dares to go on dates without a proper chaperone. But when you sort through it all, and you dismiss as much as you can to be inaccurate, you're not left with a whole lot to examine. In this case, the theories basically fall into one of two categories, that Georgette was murdered by a stranger, or that she was murdered by someone she knew. All of the investigative efforts that were put forth, all of the research and study that was conducted, and that's the best we've got to work with. It's tragic, really, and if you read through interviews with detectives who worked the case, you'll often find a lot of assumptions and few facts to back up those assumptions. Perhaps that was simply the way of 1940s investigations, or maybe, as some have argued, the money behind Georgette's family may have been used to keep certain details from the public or to guide the narrative one way or another. The truth is, for the most part, a lot of this story we may never be able to officially verify. So, we'll start with the first theory, that Georgette was murdered by someone she didn't know or perhaps had just met. We know that Georgette had a history of picking up soldiers she saw hitchhiking, Beyond giving them rides, it wasn't uncommon for her to take them out to lunch or dinner to try and do what she could to make their life a little better, even if she was only going to be around them for a short while. I've read some reports that while Georgette wasn't keen on bringing men back to her apartment unsupervised, there were some nights that she may have allowed this to happen and there were some who she may have given keys to should they need a place to crash for the night. At the time, this was depicted as a scandalous act with Georgette allowing strange men to stay over at her place. But from everything I've read, it sounds like she'd give them a blanket and a pillow for the couch while she went upstairs and slept alone. Either way, she was a grown woman and capable of making her own choices, but had the unfortunate luck to live in an era where women weren't expected to be independent. On the night of her murder, Georgette allegedly picked up and gave a ride to Sergeant Gordon Adland. According to his story, she dropped him off on Sunset Boulevard and then went along her way. Adlin was ruled out as a suspect after his story was verified and it was proven he was elsewhere when the crime took place. That, however, doesn't mean that Georgette couldn't have come upon another soldier when she got closer to home and either offered a ride or maybe a place to stay. I've read several theories in which this hitchhiker could have gotten frustrated, been drunk, or just been out looking for trouble, and the idea of sleeping on a couch while a vulnerable young woman slept upstairs just didn't seem like the more pleasurable option in his twisted mind. Perhaps this man wanted more, and by the time Georgette realized the truth, it was too late. The hitchhiker angle of the theory is certainly possible, but it does leave some questions unanswered. If this person was brought back to her apartment and came in with her, why the need to adjust the bulb so that the light didn't work? Had Georgette brought a man home, why was she the only one who appeared to have eaten anything? A single dish in the sink, a cantaloupe rind in the trash, but no indication that she had any kind of company outside of cigarettes. The cigarettes themselves are a bizarre clue. Who just smokes cigarettes in someone's apartment and puts them out on the floor? Was this done in the company of Georgette, or could it have been done by someone waiting for her? Since nearly the first days of the investigation, there were those who believed that whoever killed Georgette was in her apartment waiting for her to come home. How this person gained entry has been debated. Maybe Georgette forgot to lock the door, or this person knew another way in. Beyond that, we've heard that Georgette gave out copies of her keys, and some people may have still had those keys. Once inside, it was just a matter of waiting. The person would probably have known an approximate time that Georgette would be coming home, and he'd have to be prepared for her arrival. Based on the conditions of the home, the jewelry left behind, I don't believe this was a robbery gone wrong. Yeah, the killer may have taken $75, but we don't even know that for certain. We know that early in the day, Georgette allegedly had $75 left over from the purchase of the airline tickets, but we have no way of knowing what happened to that money. She could have given some away, she could have bought drinks and dinner, she could have done anything with it, really. Even if the killer did take the money, it seems rather secondary. The jewelry was left behind, 
which is not something a robber would do, but it is something someone might do if they believe that the jewelry could connect them to the murder. Ultimately, it's hard to know what role robbery played in things, but given the results of that night, it seems pretty clear that Georgette was the primary target. We know from Georgette's diary that there were several men she'd gone out on dates with, established friendships with, and had some level of correspondence with. You're talking about an attractive 20-year-old woman tied to a large fortune, so I don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibility that one of these men could have wanted more from her, and upon being rebuffed, viewed his only response to have been one of anger and violence. This, of course, doesn't mean that this is the only possibility. Some men just want what they can't have and are willing to push themselves into very dark places to get it. We also know, 75 years later, that there are some for whom a sexual assault and murder are the ultimate goals. The rag stuffed down Georgette's throat, if indeed brought by the killer, would seem to indicate a soldier, but as we know, none of the fingerprints found matched a soldier. That, though, doesn't mean a soldier couldn't have committed this crime. It's not like they were working off of a large fingerprint database at the time. These comparisons had to be made in person, and whether or not they missed someone, we may never know. Besides, Georgette was around a lot of soldiers a lot of the time, and there's nothing to suggest that it's impossible that the rag was already in her possession, meaning that her killer simply grabbed it and used it, rather than bringing it along to commit the crime. If you were going to murder someone by asphyxiation, it would seem more logical to bring along a rope or twine rather than a rag, but again, that's a detail we simply don't have enough information about. At the end of the day, this murder being perpetrated by a stranger, by someone who didn't know Georgette before that night, can't be ruled out. We all know the dangers of picking up hitchhikers these days, but in the 1940s, picking up a hitchhiking soldier seemed like a pretty safe bet, and given that Georgette had done it many times in the past and never had a negative result, probably just worked to reinforce the belief in her mind that it was safe. I could explore the stranger possibility forever because, frankly, there's a lot of people walking around Los Angeles and Hollywood, and any number of them could have been responsible for the crime. For the most part, though, those who examine this case believe the connection between Georgette and her killer was more than likely personal, and that takes us to the second and final theory, that Georgette was killed by someone she knew and perhaps someone she trusted. If we're looking at people that Georgette knew, we haven't done a great deal to shorten the list of potential suspects. Beyond the names in her diary, there are friends, family members, acquaintances, business associates of her father, and the list goes on and on. What we have to look at is the circumstances of the crime and see which makes more sense, stranger or someone she knew. I've always felt that in this case, the killer was more than likely someone she knew, but that's purely my opinion. We begin with the light bulb. This is an area for me which contradicts the known killer theory to some degree. If this killer knew Georgette and planned to use their relationship as a way to gain entry to the apartment, then why darken the light so she couldn't clearly identify him? Well, there's the possibility that she'd recognize him by voice, and maybe the light was dim so that no potential witnesses could see him. However, there's also the chance that this was someone Georgette knew but didn't get along with well, and so perhaps his intention was to obscure his identity through the light and to use his voice to pretend to be someone else. I've even considered the possibility that the bulb was adjusted later after the murder to conceal his exit, but logic dictates that this was probably done ahead of time. So assuming this man knows Georgette, there's a few different scenarios that could have brought him to the apartment. Firstly, he could have simply gone over there, knocked on the door, and Georgette let him in. Maybe he needed a place to stay, and Georgette offered the couch, or maybe he was just looking to chat for a short amount of time. Either way, we can't rule out that Georgette may have allowed her killer into the apartment. However, there are at least two other ways people have argued that someone could have gained entry. Firstly, someone could have been waiting for Georgette to arrive home, hiding themselves in the night, and when she approached the building, they could have approached her. Now, this could have gone one of two ways. The person could have produced a weapon and forced Georgette into her apartment, or this could have been someone she recognized and they played it off like happenstance and she invited them in for a few minutes. The other way many have considered is that the killer may have gained entry by being in possession of a key. There's a lot of confusion about it, but there does appear to be stories that Georgette had given copies of her keys to people in the past, and there are, of course, former apartment complex employees who had their own copies. One of the first theories about this murder that I read, and which was addressed in newspapers written at the time, was police believing that the killer was already inside the apartment when Georgette arrived home. By many discussions I've read, 
It's believed that the killer may have been hiding out in Georgette's bedroom. And so when she arrived home, had a snack, and then went upstairs to change into her pajamas, the man may have made himself appear, at which time the struggle took place. Let's face it, we don't have enough information about the crime or the killer to really be able to nail down exactly what happened here, so we've got to look at what we do know. Georgette was found in the bathtub. Her body was nude from the waist down. She was bruised, her nose was bloodied, and there was a rag shoved down her throat. Examination showed that she'd been the victim of a sexual assault, and while her apartment wasn't ransacked, there were cigarettes put out on the floor and her pajamas were found torn in her bedroom. While we may not know exactly what happened, it seems quite clear that at some point, the killer attacked Georgette and the rag was either used as a way to silence and murder her, or it was purely used as the murder weapon. I've always wondered if Georgette was assaulted pre- or post-mortem, and I know that's a bizarre thing to wonder, but it makes a pretty big difference in determining what kind of a person you're looking for. For me, it always felt like jealousy and greed were potential motives here. A soldier returns, one perhaps who had dated Georgette in the past, finds out she's been seeing other people and perhaps about the man in Texas, and wants revenge. That's a scenario I could buy, especially if we're talking about someone who may have been overseas, seen combat, and experienced a high level of trauma associated with the war, the kind of trauma they had no idea how to treat in 1944. There's a couple of details I've always wondered about. The cigarettes are weird. Putting them out on the floor of the apartment rather than an ashtray or a cup feels pretty disrespectful, like this person was trying to show Georgette that he could do whatever he wanted to do. The bathtub I've also found curious. Whether or not the killer ran the bath water or if Georgette prepared her bath before the killer struck, I couldn't tell you, but we know she was asphyxiated and not drowned. The medical examiner showed little water was found in her lungs. This seems to suggest that after Georgette died, the killer tossed her into the tub, with the medical examiner believing this caused some of her bruising. So why throw her in the tub face down? Face down might be related to the killer feeling shame for the act he had committed and not wanting to look her in the eye. The tub itself could have represented his own desire to clean what he considered to be an unclean woman, which might be psychologically connecting to this person being jealous that she had spent time with other men. Now, I'm no psychologist, and this is purely speculative on my part, but it feels like a personal attack against her. She was a bright young woman with a generally clean public perception, and perhaps this killer wanted to destroy some of that. The killer likely knew she was dead. He didn't remove the rag from her mouth. The medical examiner said the scratches near her mouth may have been from the killer trying to remove it, though I think there's also the possibility the scratches could have been from Georgette's own hand as she fought to remove it from her throat. I don't know what to think about the rag, frankly, which we know was part of a bandage that a soldier who had been overseas may have been in possession of. I know that the War Department looked through soldiers' records in search of the fingerprints, but again, it would be a manual search, and I somehow doubt in 1944 that it was super difficult to get away with a crime if all the police had were your fingerprints. Georgette knew a lot of soldiers, she was an oil heiress, and she had a tendency to go out of her way to try and help and support soldiers, while also being attracted to men in uniform. The possibilities there are pretty extensive. We have no idea how many men Georgette came across in her life, how many she bought dinner for or danced with at the canteen, but it only takes one to suddenly decide she belongs to him, and from there it's a slippery slope. We also have to consider this could have been a crime committed by a civilian who was jealous about a soldier, and perhaps that bandage was used to point the direction of a soldier. The car is a strange detail as well. Why take it? Maybe the guy panicked and wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible, or maybe he planned to leave it somewhere to point the finger at someone else, but if you're going to loosen the light bulb to in some way help disguise your identity, it seems pretty risky to then be driving around in the victim's car. Anyone could have seen him at that time, though apparently he was lucky enough that no one did. It's yet another clue in a case where there are a few clues that connect to anything significant. Which do you believe is more likely? That Georgette knew her killer, or that this was done either at random, or by someone who had seen Georgette, but never actually spent time with her? The murder of Georgette Bauerdorf hits its 75th anniversary 10 days ago. 75 years of silence, 75 years of a killer walking the streets and never having to pay the price. The likelihood that Georgette's killer is still alive today seems quite low, though we do know that her sister Constance only passed away five years ago, so there's a chance. Unfortunately, unlike cold cases we see being solved today, there's really nothing to work with. 
There's no DNA to examine. There's no eyewitness reports to examine. No, whoever killed Georgette got away with it, and the potential for this case to ever be solved becomes less and less every year. Georgette Bauerdorf was a good woman. She was a kind and caring, bright and focused, and beautiful and alluring young lady. Unfortunately, still in today's world, there are people who only wish to take beautiful things for themselves and to leave a wake of destruction behind. Georgette's life was needlessly snuffed out at the young age of 20, and who knows what her life could have been had she lived. Indeed, Hollywood in the 1940s holds many dark secrets, and the murder of Georgette Bauerdorf may be one of the most disturbing and least addressed. While it's a sad thing to acknowledge, the likelihood that Georgette's murderer will ever be caught is extremely slim, and the possibility that her case will be solved is almost completely impossible at this point in time. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Georgette Bauerdorf, there are many websites, forums, and archived news articles you can read. I highly recommend checking out georgettebauerdorf.com for some detailed information that's been provided there. If you have any information about the murder of Georgette Bauerdorf, please contact the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office or the FBI. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. I wanted to give a quick thank you to all of you who've been very patient with me these past two weeks. Uh, I got very sick last week and couldn't release this episode or finish it. And then this week, my back's out, so I had to do this one-day delay on it. But my back's feeling a little bit better today. I'm hoping it stays that way, and I just really appreciate your patience and support. I also wanted to let you know that I recorded an episode of Is This Adulting yesterday, so that'll be coming out later this week. If you haven't listened to that podcast, you should totally check it out. I had an amazing time, and when it comes out, I'll certainly be sharing it with all of you. It's time for a shout-out to our amazing Patreon producers. Angie Dodd, Emily Smith, Megan Cotter, Kate Alexander, Chandra Moreau, Robbie Blue, Brian Kemmerling, Wannabe Sleuth 2, Laura Dickinson, Julia Rexon, Diane Dyson, Tom Archer, Eamon Brady, Nick Mohar Schurz, Alicia Lorraine, Jessica, Krista Colvin, Randy Wyland, Brittany Bivens, Glenda Piper, and Megan. You're all amazing. And if you're new and I mispronounced your name, just shoot me a message and I'll correct it. I just wanted to remind all of you that this Saturday, October 26th, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Tommy Condon's Restaurant in Charleston, South Carolina, I'll be representing Trace Evidence at a meetup, which includes other podcasts such as Southern Fried True Crime, Pleasing Terrors, Something's Not Right, Flat Rock, Pretend, Already Gone, and Melissa from Moms and Murder will also be there. So we're certainly looking forward to seeing you and having a good time getting to know our listeners. That's going to do it for this episode, so I want to thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.